Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us for today's webinar, The Value of Employee Communications During the COVID-19 Crisis. I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. So folks who um, are speaking, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Hi, Ben. Excellent. Well, hello, everyone. We welcome all of our clients, colleagues, and the many executives joining us from Georgian Partners today. I'm Jen McClure, and I am joined by, if I can get my slides to move, um, my associate, Adria Barish, and editor of our media and learning platform, Biznology, and of course, our featured speakers and member consultants, Mark Dollins and Sharon McIntosh, and I want to thank them for joining us today for this important topic. Today's webinar is being presented by GEM and our consulting division, Consultants Collective, and following the webinar, the recording will be available on Biznology, our media and learning platform, and Adria will be sending you all an email after this event with a brief survey and a link to the recording so that you can share it with your colleagues. So before we get started today, I'd like to share a little bit about Consultants Collective for those of you who are not familiar with us. We are a new kind of management consultancy offering an innovative, flexible, scalable network-based approach. What does that mean? What, we have nearly 40 carefully vetted independent consultants, two of whom are with us today, serving our clients as one firm. Our consultants have all had um, executive level experience at large and leading companies and different types of organizations around the globe, as you will hear today. And so we can offer an unparalleled level of talent across a wide range of specialties and functions, serving our clients in a variety of industries. As unlike other firms, we are extremely flexible um, and you can get the right independent experts you need at the right time. And we take on your mission critical projects right from inception, from strategy, through, through execution. We really share our professional values of being mission-driven um, and not only focusing on the bottom line, but on mission and purpose. And we really pride ourselves on providing a cohesive client experience through our collaboration. Um, and our hope is that we are, re the result is that the whole client experience um, is being greater than the sum of its parts, i.e. our network of independent consultants. So we really consider Consultants Collective Management Consulting for the future of work. As I said, we have a wide range of experience from change management and communications to customer success, design thinking, digital transformation. We have folks that are focusing on the future of work. We have financial professionals, human capital professionals, IT professionals, folks focusing on risk management, sales, technology deployment, and even work-life integration, which I think will become extremely important as we have more and more people working from home during this crisis. Um, so look forward to additional resources, both um, articles on biz knowledge, tip sheets, and additional webinars in all of these areas. Our goal is to provide a peer-based approach to help executives and leadership teams to grow and be successful, solve the complex problems that they face, start new initiatives, really transform their organizations, and lead in a new direction. As you can see, we serve a diverse group of leaders, and we have a diverse group of senior executives on the line today from HR, corporate communications, public relations, marketing, those who oversee legal and safety for their organizations, and more. Uh, Sharon and Mark have really been th very thoughtful about this, and they have developed a great program for you that we hope everyone will find valuable but we also wanna make this really interactive and we look forward to your questions. So we have to dedicated a lot of time in this session to addressing those. And we will be using the Slido platform as Adria shared in her email with you. So she will tell you more about that um, later on in the call. Uh, but for now, I wanna get started with Mark and Sharon. So I am very pleased to introduce our speakers. Uh, you can see that we also have their social media handles here and hashtag you can use should, should you want to use social media during this call. Um, Sharon is a senior member of Consultants Collective and president of And Then Communications. 
She has more than two decades of communications experience with Fortune 500 companies, and her clients through and then have included United Technologies, Otis Elevator, Toyota, and many more. Prior to launching her consultancy, she served as PepsiCo's Vice President of Global Internal Communications, where she led the company's first social media training, Smart You, and PepsiCo's award-winning Employee Ambassador Program. Before joining PepsiCo, Sharon spent seven years at Sears, where she led user experience, live events, and launched customer service and the company's first internet. And prior to Sears, Sharon worked at Waste Management. Mark is also a senior consultant with Consultants Collective and president of North Star Communications Consulting, which focuses on communications talent development and employee change communication strategy. Founded in 2011, North Star has provided communications consulting services to Visa, Toyota, Louis Vuitton, Xerox, Keep America Beautiful, and many more. His prior corporate experience is, spans more than 30 years with Fortune 500 companies, including head, and exec, head of executive and global employee communications for DuPont. Previously, Mark spent 17 years in executive communications leadership roles with PepsiCo, including senior vice president and chief communications officer roles. He also spent 10 years in corporate communications in the energy sector, and he began his career in journalism. Mark currently serves on the National Advisory Council of George Washington University's School of Media and Public Affairs. And, fun fact, he is also a certified USA wrestling coach and a two-time National USA Wrestling Masters folk style champion. So with that, I will turn it over to Mark and Sharon. And thank you again to both of you for joining us today and putting this together so quickly at such an important, uh, for such an important topic. Pleasure to be here, thank Jen. You. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Mark and I are um, really honored that so many people are taking the time out of this week. And what a week it has been. Um, Mark and I have both been dealing with, with clients this week and doing coronavirus planning, So, and it's, it's changing so quickly. We're really in a defining moment for our profession, our companies, and even personally. And how companies handle this moment of crisis reflects the company values, values of health and wellness, values of supporting work-life realities, values of meeting customer needs in the face of huge obstacles. And the entire world feels like it's operating in uncertainty. And what we want to talk about today is that we believe that consistent, clear communications can bring calm and confidence. So today, Mark and I are going to be uh, talking and thinking about our planning as these events continue to unfold. So, Adrian, let's begin with a temperature check on your preparedness. Hold on. <laughs> Folks on the phone, we haven't done these before, so hopefully <laughs> our polling is working. Okay. How okay, great. prepared do you believe your communications team is for the coronavirus? It's working. Great. So very prepared, somewhat prepared, or not at all prepared. Give you Leave it open for five more answer. seconds. Okay, we're going to end the poll, share the results. I'm not prepared. That's, I think that's where most companies probably are as, as we well. Are um, but I think what we want to talk about is why this crisis might be different than what we've experienced in the past. So, Mark, over to you. Oops, Mark on mute. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you now. Okay, sorry, yeah. All right, <laughs> so this is different. Um, you know, chances are good that a lot of us have worked on potential or actual crises that have impacted our businesses and, and our internal stakeholders. So uh, we probably have the tools and we have processes in place, teams to activate, but this one is different. And as Sharon alluded, it, it's really different because it's not just about protecting the business, which is usually our, our, our primary concern, 
it is also about protecting personal health and the well-being of people both inside the organization and around it. In other words, it's the entire value chain that's, a clo that's associated with our business. And unlike other, you know, those of us who've worked on avian flu, H1N1, and other uh, potential um, uh, global pandemics, uh, this one is real. It is spread human to human. Um, it is a pandemic as identified by the WHO. And, you know, I, I was watching CBS uh, 60 Minutes over the weekend, and uh, a leading epidemiologist said, yeah, yeah um, it's a, it definitely meets the, um, the definition of a pandemic. So this is real, it's here, um, and it's not unique to any company or industry or geography. So that means it's out of the control of a single organization like those that, that we're working for. Everybody's affected, you know, our family, our friends, the community, suppliers, customers, partners. This is an, a test unlike any that we've ever had, and it's proof positive that forevermore we are living in a global economy, um, and a global community. So you, you're hearing every day, every hour, schools are closing, kids are at home, parents are scrambling to figure out, um, you know, how do I handle having my kids at home and assuming probably some level of responsibility for their education. So clearly everybody is impacted by this. So with that, let's start another poll. Oh, okay, great. So we're going to ask a, a question here about how often you currently are communicating about the coronavirus to your organization. So you've got a couple of choices here from, from Bailey. We haven't yet started, um, which uh, doesn't sound like that's going to be apl applicable to most of you. But give us a sense of how often you are communicating uh, across your organization. And understanding that daily could include multiple times a day so yep. whatever that whatever that is okay we're going to end the poll thank you okay more than once a day is the leading one so that's excellent oh. sounds like a number of you are very much on top of it delighted to Look. see that everyone is communicating so that's great all right, so let's let's talk about what employees want to know. You know, we hear so much about the employee experience these days. You know, what are our employees thinking and feeling? What do they need? Well, they want the same thing that everybody on this call wants, and they want to know, am I safe? You know, uh, what is my employer doing uh, to protect me in, in, in what clearly are unprecedented times? They want to know what are the actions that uh, the organization is taking and what they can do to protect themselves um, and their loved ones, right? So this gets into that extended um, uh, world of stakeholders we're, we're trying to make sure are included in our communications. And a lot of that is about how are they going to be empowered to take control of the situation because that's what everybody's looking to do. Clearly, they want to know, how does this affect my job? What options am I going to have? Can I, in fact, work from home? And if other people can work from home but I have a job that doesn't allow me to do that, what other options are available to me? They want to know who's making the decisions and with what kinds of input. So always important to be thinking about not just the subject matter experts inside the organization, but who outside is being engaged to provide some um, uh, expertise on how to counsel and provide answers to key questions that are emerging and, and developing very quickly. And don't forget there's a lot of people in these organizations who are, in fact, thinking outwardly. How can I help others? Uh, as with any crisis, we always have employees who are thinking about not just themselves, but how do they help others, whether it's colleagues or whether it's other people in the community or customers, what have you. So those are key questions that employees are looking for answers for uh, through their communication. So I'm going to move on to the next poll, which is who, right? It's always about the voice that is behind your communication. And um, we've got a list coming up here of, um, of a number of uh, options that you may have in terms of voices behind your communications. And recognizing that this also can change over time, think of it as um, who, who is sending the, uh, uh, the most recent communication in your organization. 
And the reason I make that um, delineation is because sometimes we start with perhaps people in health and wellness or a subject matter expert in operations, but as things move or progress, you may have changed and have um, uh, messages coming out from more senior people, including the CEO. So think about this as who uh, most recently are you communicating with in terms of broad, uh, broadly across your organization, who's the voice? Okay, looks like pretty close okay. between the HR and the, the CEO, so very senior level, which is um, most of what we're seeing in, in a lot of the work that we're doing with, at least I am, with, with the clients that I'm uh, currently helping navigate this issue with. So um, this clearly is something that um, would uh, rise to the occasion of having a CEO or a very senior level C-suite leader be the voice behind those communications. And that's, that's what I've been seeing as well, Mark, is that I think when sort of the crisis was kind of at its beginning stages, that it, um, that it was some, some of the folks who might not be at senior level, but as that fear grows, it's really becoming the CEO. People are looking to the CEO and for really coming out and being a leader in this, in this time. So Mark talked a little bit about the preparation of your employees, and I thought I would talk a little bit about the questions for the internal or the employee communications teams and some of the things that those folks need to be thinking about. So the first question, do we have the channels to reach all of our people? So let's face it, the majority of our organizations probably are email based. And yet we have a crisis where we have to reach 100% of the employees. It's a worldwide epidemic. Um, we have translation issues. So we really have to think about what other ways we can reach employees, maybe even going back to posters if people are in the office, but as we start moving to a more um, mobile and working from home environment, how can we reach employees through text messages and even looking at new channels such as notification systems or internal news apps. And then you heard, um, the, we did the, the poll question about whose voice should they come from. And that sort of prompts me to say, we need to make sure our leaders are prepared. The senior leaders of the organization, absolutely. The CEO getting out there in front of the messages, being able to bring that sense of calm to the organization, but also the managers really need to be prepared. Because that's the first line that, that employees are gonna turn to. And so making sure you're equipping your managers with the toolkits and the talking points and that they are feeling fully in the loop. And then this question of uh, how quickly can we respond, it really goes to uh, the point of, yes, we, we need to be able to respond quickly, but my um, personal experiences, and I'm sure many of the communicators on the phone personal experiences, if you're gonna have a message from the CEO going out and you have something like you were told at um, almost 10 o'clock at night that all of your employees in Europe um, we're probably going to want to, who are traveling in Europe from the U.S. are going to want to get home. How do you get a message out by 7 a.m. the next day? That means you can't have days to approve. That means you have to really think through ahead of time who are the three or four people who can really focus in, give you those approvals quickly, um, HR, legal, communication, so you can turn things around really quickly. And then do we have a way to collect insights and answer their questions and concerns? This is always just really good, solid internal and employee communication strategy. But at a time like this, we have to give your employees a voice. We need to make sure you have both formal and informal listening set up and give employees to ask questions beyond your standard communication. Make sure you're hearing from them on a constant, on a constant basis. And then what's the cadence and sequencing of communications? So how often will you communicate? Will you have regular communications? I'm seeing um, a lot of organizations start going to a regular weekly coronavirus uh, email that's going out and then subsidizing that with sort of key information. And then what's our tone? So as we're writing these communications, how are we balancing the fact that we wanna give our employees enough information um, and all the information that they need without causing fear. So I think making sure it's, it's fact-based, 
that it is, you know, looking at the science, but also making sure there's a humanity to it. You don't want it to sound like a robot. I have, I've been pressing clients this week that the communication needs to come from a human being, not a mailbox. So making sure it's, it's human and it's empathetic. And then finally, how are we connecting all of our internal stakeholders with solutions for customers and other external stakeholders? So employees aren't just caring about themselves um, and their families, they're also caring about the business. How is the business responding? Um, what's happening with your supply chains? What's going on with customers? Making sure you're using that as part of your communications as well. So now let's move on to how you're operationalizing all this. So let's bring up the next poll. And this goes to probably a lot, you, all of you say you have been communicating, so we're curious what kind of change in operations have you already communicated? So ranging everything from remote work from home policy, sick time, paid time off, canceled or postponed meetings, travel policy, cleaning practices, or other. And you can click all that apply. Okay. Yeah, that remote work from home policy just spiked in a big way this week. Um, travel policy, I'm sure Mark, you had the same experience. That's been out there for a couple of weeks. Um, I believe the sick time is sort of lagging a bit from what I'm seeing from my clients and I'm definitely seeing the cleaning as well. Anything else you're seeing, Mark? Yeah, absolutely what I'm seeing. Can, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yeah, absolutely what I'm seeing. And I think um, even those with remote and work from home policies, um, they're quickly discovering that in some cases they have to be revisited because of the unique um, conditions. For example, um, some clients may have um, requirements that um, when people work from home, uh, they have to have an absolutely quiet work environment. So if you're doing customer service, for example, well, now with, with, uh, uh, with parents uh, needing to cover for kids who are at home because their schools are closed, um, it, it's going to require them to relook at those policies and figure out what, how they can make some work in this, uh, this particular environment. Great point. Yeah, so let's, let's kind of look at what we're seeing in terms of what companies are starting to do in terms of policies and practices and guidelines. And clearly, um, almost everybody has activated or is activating cross-functional, integrated, global response teams, right? And they're looking at uh, the procedures and the policies that they have. Um, my experience recently is that those that were meeting maybe two to three times a week are now meeting daily because things are changing so, so quickly. And the things that they're looking at are, um, as you, your polling indicates, travel policies, uh, when uh, WHO indicates level two and three countries, um, and also even domestically here in the U.S., uh, flying or traveling in and out of those hot spots, whether it's New York City or the Seattle metro area. Um, and then the policies also extend not just to what you're doing on business, but also what you're doing personally. So if I don't travel on business, but I need to get back to Seattle to visit a family member, what happens if I go and I come back? So um, a lot of companies are starting to look at, all right, we're going to have to implement some self-quarantine, even if you're not traveling on company uh, business, but you're going to these areas that are identified as hot spots either by CDC or WHO. Clearly, they're looking also at site cleaning practices and, and in most cases upgrading what they're doing and they're communicating about them. The work from home, as we've talked about, is a really, really big issue because it's not just, hey, let's make sure people understand the existing uh, work from home um, uh, policies. In many cases, it, it won't apply to all jobs um, because people there are certain roles where people can't work from home. Um, and there are clear implications on the workload for IT systems, right, not to mention security issues. Um, many organizations still issue tokens uh, for, for laptops so they can get access to uh, virtual private networks or VPNs. Also, um, organizations are being tasked with looking at issuing more devices, right? So more uh, laptops, more tablets, more um, uh, cell phone or iPhones, whatever the, the uh, communication technology is. 
And so even related to that, um, there are issues now with, well, how do you clean those things? So people who are just quick to grab, grab a particular type of wipe may not realize that um, it can uh, erode the surface on some of these um, uh, devices, uh, and some are more um, you know, dangerous or more impactful on those surfaces than others. So it's always good to be checking with you know, the vendors and with your IT department to say, hey, if you're going to clean your devices, which a lot of people want to do more of, you better be using the right kind of um, uh, product to make sure you're not damaging it because there's a big potential uh, price tag coming with that if, uh, over a long term. Uh, organizations are looking, obviously, at the PTO, our personal time off, and sick day policies, and the protocols um, and the benefits of the medical coverage plan. For example, will my, um, uh, will my COVID-19 testing be covered by my current health plan? So there needs to be uh, getting those questions answered and, and, uh, and communicating to employees who, are, who have that, that medical plan coverage. If I'm quarantined, do I get paid? And, um, and when, when does that actually and officially start? Who do I notify? Those are all questions that are really being actively pursued by many of the clients that I'm working with. And they're looking at, as Sharon mentioned, the established cadence of communication. So where do we place all this information that's changing and moving so quickly? Um, they're monitoring the global and national and local um, uh, health and uh, safety um, uh, organizations that are monitoring this. They're getting guidance versus the law of the land, you know, where, where states are enacting certain kinds of requirements. So it's, it's very complex, and that's why these cross-functional teams are so critical so that um, we really kind of extend the, the tendrils, if you will, of every organization using the subject matter experts who can dive into their particular field report back and, and offer options to uh, the decision-making body. And as, as Sharon said, clearly they're listening uh, internally, particularly if you've got field locations, what are they saying, what are they thinking, uh, what are employees feeling, and are they in fact living up to the core values that have been expressed in most organizations. So lot, lots of things that these uh, cross-functional teams are working on. And um, let's take a look to kind of recommendations as we, as we are sitting here and the things that we're seeing. Obviously, we want to make sure that our response teams are, are activated. Um, it should be part of a, a, a comp has to be part of the overall crisis communication team, which is meeting regular. Clearly, a reason to partner with um, information technology on digital red readiness, uh, just to make sure that we understand the processes, the protocols for getting new um, or additional equipment that allows, for example, uh, for working from home. Um, anything we can do to give employees a sense of control, I mean, um, it may not sound like a lot, but when we talk to them about personal hygiene and staying at home, um, and you know, for example, how can leaders um, lead effectively when they're now having to deal with remote teams that they weren't working on? We're seeing organizations looking at creating guides for how leaders can do that, and that's usually not um, something difficult to create because there's a lot of information out there on, on best practices for leaders who are... And, uh, who find themselves in that position perhaps uh, less, um, less uh, unexpectedly. Um, you want to make sure as, that you're depending on reputable sources and, 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 as we said before, communicating who it is that you're listening to. So whether it's the WHO or CDC, internal health and safety experts or industry experts, those are the kinds of voices that you want to make sure are represented in your consideration and in your communication so that people know we're, we're really listening um, to experts in this, in this space. Uh, updating emergency contact numbers, whether you're in Workday or whatever HR system that you're in, um, that's definitely something that every employee can do. It's an empowerment um, recommendation for them, as well as uh, getting uh, personal or, or emergency contact uh, information for their direct team members, which may not be something they can do directly in Workday, but we're seeing um, uh, leaderships uh, talking to um, uh, people managers in their organizations saying, make sure you know how to get a hold of these people because things are moving, they're changing very quickly, and let make sure that they know how to get in touch with you and their fellow team members. So those emergency contact lists are, are pretty critical. And then finally, we're seeing a lot of uh, effort and understanding of the stress that this is creating for employees. So many organizations have employee assistance programs or EAP programs, um, and, and uh, it's really important when you have those to underscore 
um, your recognition as an organization, this is creating a really new level of stress or anxiety, and you have this resource in place, encourage employees to use it, or encourage them to different places where they can go for more information or responses to specific questions that they have. So a pretty um, extensive list of things to do, and perhaps this is a checklist that uh, maybe there's a one or two items that you're not, but it sounds like you've got a lot of those covered. Great, thanks, Mark. Um, so we also wanted to talk about longer term, which those of you who have been living the crisis this week, it's hard to, to th even think about longer term, but we really need to understand how to prepare for the future. So as much as I've seen, again, people are, are looking at like what's happening next week or what, you know, we're in such a reactive mode, how do we look beyond the next two weeks? What's your plan for the next several weeks even, or even perhaps a few months? Because we're running so fast, it's hard to keep on top of what's coming the next day. But effective crisis management has told us we must look further down the road. So you have to look at the different scenarios with your, with your business and be looking at how you can respond to those different scenarios. And I do believe one of those keys is getting your managers and the tools and the channel set up now so that you can, you can deliver what may be in the next few, few weeks or months. And then second, I would say prioritizing your work. So most of the time we're focusing on what needs to get done, but you're gonna have to look hard at what has to stop or what has to be postponed and the business will continue but again can you have folks who are dedicated just to this crisis team and um, and work with the teams with it, with your, within your own team to prioritize the work and then I also think you're going to be partnering with your diversity team Unfortunately, as the fear increases, it often results in xenophobia. So we need to remind employees that they need to treat each other with respect and to really honor those diversity and inclusion and engagement values of your organization. And then you really need to identify critical communications employees. So hopefully your HR team is in the process of identifying who those critical employees are across the whole organization, but even within your communications team, you need to be thinking about who is that person who knows how to send out emails. If they're using a tool like Populo or Banana Tag, sometimes there's a whole training that goes with that. So how can you cross, um, cross train on those skill sets? And then uh, I think a lot of organizations are thinking about working from home, but I'm not sure they're also thinking about what happens if that employee gets sick and can't, can't do that role from home. So, I, I worry about, I know there's so many organizations out there who have a one person show doing internal comms. So who is that person who's going to be the backup? And then understanding the future competencies that are gonna be needed. So your teams are gonna know, have to know how to work remotely, not just for a day, but perhaps weeks or even longer. And more importantly, your managers are gonna to need to know how to manage remotely. I was reading that Facebook just held training sessions on how to train their supervisors for remote workers. So I think there's gonna be new skills that we're gonna to have to bring into, into play and um, working with HR to think through what are those training pieces. And then finally, which it realized it seems for, forever off, but uh, I believe someday we're gonna need a recovery plan. So as part of your business continuity, you should be thinking about what happens after the crisis begins to recover. Your employees have been working a completely different way if they've been working from home for so long and the impact may be great. So um, with that, uh, Mark, let me turn it over to you for some final thoughts. Sure, we wanna to get to your questions quickly, but um, Sharon alluded to this earlier and I wanna underscore it how organizations are responding to the internal stakeholders here likely is going to be a defining moment about how they live up to those core values that appear in all of our annual reports and our, our employee communication. So uh, about respecting employees or however it's articulated, but the actions that we're taking now um, have to be uh, have to be made and, and the decisions have to be made through the lens of is this consistent with our core values of uh, however we're defining that respect for employees. 
the communication planning that's in place now likely is um, you know, taking place very, very quickly, but as you get to the weekends or you get opportunities to uh, think about that future state, as um, Sharon uh, very um, articulately mentioned, uh, really need to be thinking about a longer-term strategy to make sure that you've got everything you need from the tools, from the measurement pieces, from the feedback, um, and, uh, and, the, and the consistent communication and the processes to make sure you're delivering what employees need um, to, to do the job and to feel that the company is um, considering them fully in the decisions that they're making. So, um, Sharon, anything you wanted to add before we head off to their questions? Um, sure, just a couple of things. I would say uh, just a reminder of the importance of flexibility. I've really seen it this week and to take some, some deep breaths. Uh, your crisis team is not just managing the crisis, but they're living the crisis. So what I would ask all organizations to do and bring forward today is empathy. I'd like to see empathy in your CEO communications, empathy with your crisis team, and empathy with each other. Mr. Rogers is the one who said to look for the helpers and we have an opportunity to help each other and our organizations. And really the only thing we can say with absolute certainty is that we're in this together. So with that, let me turn it over to, for Q&A, open up to your questions. Okay, as we mentioned before, the Q&A will be hosted on Slido, spelled S-L-I dot C-O. So if you log in there, it will prompt you to enter an event code, which will be Consultants Collective. Sharon, isn't this where you start humming something from you, Zach? <laughs> you don't want to hear me sing. I'll do the second chorus. How about that? <laughs> well, while we're waiting for the um, for the folks to to put their questions into the Slido platform, um, if if I well, we don't really have anyone who hasn't done any communications, but um, we we may have organizations where they're still having to convince their senior leadership of the importance of internal communications and regular communications. So. Um, how do you how do you at this time um, convince senior leadership uh, to really buy in, support, and participate in internal communications? Well, I'll I'll jump in and ask Sarah to, to follow up here. But sure. it, there's 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 nothing like uh, presenting um, a, a business issue from a risk point of view to get their attention. So if you start highlighting what happens if we don't communicate, if we don't investigate or in, invest in, um, in internal communications, and you're clearly able to define a case that says, man, if we don't do this, we're in big trouble, uh, uh, it's going to be, you're going to be hard pressed to find uh, an executive who, who, uh, who will disagree with, yeah, that sounds like a, a risk to my business that I, I need to get behind. And the way to do that is through, is through communicating internally. Second thing is um, there's nothing like uh, benchmarking uh, and looking at best practices to say this is what's happening in our industry with a competitor, with, uh, with what we're seeing in, in best practices um, in this space and on this particular type of topic uh, or issue. Also to get their attention that, that what you're asking them to do is not unique. Um, it, in fact, it's, it's kind of table stakes at this point. Yeah, I'd love that. I think um, senior leadership often responds to that. You can uh, look to all the different CEOs that are talking today, um, and they are the person who's out in front of the organization. And you can also look in your email box and, and see all the messages that are coming from the CEO. Again, in a time of fear, people want to hear from those, those senior leaders. And I think um, sort of having that, that candid conversation with your executives that this is a time where they really need to step up and besides manage, managing the business, they are, they are the person that employees are looking to and they will set the tone on ensuring that there's that calm and confidence. Great, thank you. All right, we have our, uh, we have our first question. So 
How much notice should we give employees about the long-term work from home? And how do we ensure that they bring everything they need from home? So I can start with that, Mark, and you can add on. Um, you know, the, a lot of times you're not even having that option. So um, I think at some point our governors are going to be getting involved and in just saying it's going to happen. I am seeing a lot of organizations uh, putting putting things in place to tell employees to start bringing their um, all, everything that they need to start working from home, to start thinking about how to set up a home office and what they need today. And then what are some of the web-based tools that they can start using? So I think that communication cannot start, that, that could have started yesterday. Um, but I think it's kind of up to you and the organization um, when you wanna make that call, but I'm seeing it, it, it's happening. It's definitely going in that direction, almost across the board for any type of knowledge-based workers. Yeah, I, I would just add on, I, I think it's also about how ready the organization is to put the word out, right? Because when you start saying right. yes, work, work from home is an option, you need to have all your, uh, your answers before the questions start coming in. You know, can I take my printer home with me because I don't have one at home and I really need one? And if I can take a printer home, uh, will security stop me on the way out of the building? You know, what, uh, so those kinds of policy questions, those kinds of security questions, uh, again, the, the, the value of these cross-functional teams uh, assessing and talking about these things will really help and define when the organization is ready to say, okay, we need to start working from home. So the sooner you get ahead of that, the, the better. Great. Okay, next question. I agree the empathy part is key. So should CEOs mix empathetic communications with policy announcements or keep them distinct if possible? So I, I think um, most of the day-to-day -day stuff is, should not be coming necessarily from the, the CEO's voice. I think the CEO's uh, role in this is to ensure that the organization knows that he or she has the pulse of the organization and uh, is clearly monitoring and quite frankly is just on it, right? That, that um, the, the, the systems that are in place to help understand what's happening, how to make decisions and um, clearly convey them to the organization, that feels like the broader role of the CEO, uh, which would obviously include empathy, as Sharon uh, very astutely mentioned. I think, you know, the, the the day-to-day -day communications, okay, these new countries or these new cities are now, you know, uh, travel bans or whatever the updates are going to be. I don't think you need the CEO level communication for that kind of communication. That might uh, work better with either the travel or the, the HR department, but that's usually something that the, the that cross-functional working team can work through about um, the level of, of communication and when to engage the CEO. So if it's a significant change, um, then for sure the CEO should be involved, but in a lot of the day-to-day, -day, because the stuff is moving so quickly, not necessarily have to go through the voice of the CEO. Mm -hmm. That's a great, great point. And I'm seeing most, most companies do have an, a dedicated intranet site that they're putting up all their coronavirus, all their policy changes. And I think, you know, constantly, you know, all the communications, making sure you're sending them back to, to some type of central place and uh, whether that's, an internal or even I think some companies are probably even going to start looking at doing something externally so they can reach their their folks who don't have email and then um, yes as far as the the CEO should still keep at a CEO level but they could certainly say but you'll be hearing more from our head of HR um, over the coming weeks and sort of acknowledging that the other leadership is stepping up will will really go a long way just one other thing I'm going to add to that, Sharon, is, is about the critical role of communicators, uh, particularly in large and more complex or decentralized organizations where you may have divisions or geographies saying, oh, I, you know, I need to communicate this uh, particular issue or policy decision. Um, you can imagine uh, the, the complexity and the frustration on employees' parts if they're getting one update from a functional leader, another one from a geographical leader, another one from a global leader about this stuff. This is where 
communications has to have a, a clearinghouse role in understanding all of the communications that are being prepared uh, across the enterprise so they can ensure that there is the right cadence or where it's, it's, it makes sense to group or to bundle some of those types of communications together. Otherwise, you kind of have a free-for-all, and it gets very difficult to get your hands around both the process and around the messaging to ensure that it's consistent. And I think making sure that those those different communicators within the divisions that they're also meeting daily, so everybody knows what's the communication that's happening. You can't be doing anything in a silo. Um, even even if you're a decentralized organization, this is the time where you've got to come together. All right, next question. Our leaders are looking for daily communication even when there is no update to share. What do you suggest for balancing that need without feeding into fear? So I think it, it needs to be a, a regular communication. So I think telling people when the communication is coming and then reassuring them that, that if there is something that is going to change, that, that you will communicate it at, as soon as you know it. So ensuring you sort of have a dedication to that transparency and, um, and, and so the employees and leaders know when the communication is coming, who it's coming from and by what means. And then again, making sure that they have an avenue where they can they can feed back that that information as well. Yeah, I think you, you can also uh, consider some kind of a, a, a I'll call it a abbreviated distribution list to let's say more senior leaders in the organization that might, for example, follow a daily meeting of the um, uh, the, the, the crisis, crisis team, team mm -hmm. right? That, and even if point. the email said no new policy decisions, everything stands as is, we'll update you tomorrow, at least gives them a summary um, without having to go across the entire organization. Because if you go two or three days without a development, which I think eventually that time will come, um, getting a note that says, every day that says nothing new today can create another issue, right? But if it's a limited distribution to more senior leaders and you'll have to decide like what level is the right level in your organization to, to send that, it's one way of very quickly and efficiently just saying no news today, everything is as is. Okay. Um, in addition to communicating to employees, would it be good to hear positive stories from employees about how they're dealing with the new reality? Yeah, <laughs> yes. I think I think it's it's um, a, as we get further. Mark and I were talking about this yesterday. What happens when it gets further into the crisis and it's sort of a steady state, if you will? Um, I think that is a huge opportunity for for us as storytellers to really bring out some of those positive things that people are are hungry for um, when you're sitting there watching the news 24 seven, as I'm sure we all have been this week, it's, it's a very stressful environment. So that, that point that there are employees out there doing probably yeoman's work would be fantastic. And I think so welcomed um, to really continue to increase pride in your organization during all of this. Yeah, agreed. And especially if, if what they're doing connects to a cultural attribute that you really want to uh, pump the volume up on. So if it's, hey, we're a, we're a flexible, nimble organization, uh, we pride ourselves in collaboration and problem solving, those kinds of um, uh, stories that, that reflect that in different working environments are really powerful, saying, look, we throw it at us, we, we'll, we'll deal with it. We'll not only deal, but we'll thrive um, with, with the challenge. Because my, my guess is, as, as you continue as we continue down this path, there's probably going to be a huge opportunity for innovation here. Yeah. So my guess is there's going to be a lot of creativity and stories we can tell from that front as people are sort of put into these positions. Yeah, I, the other thing is you know, for organizations that struggle with, okay, we don't get our, our people aren't really using our social collaboration platforms. Boy, this is a, such a big opportunity to show the value of being able to collaborate remotely and using those new kinds of digital tools. Uh, mm -hmm. Use the opportunity as you know when the when the when the smoke clears from this initial um, kind of I won't say chaos but there's just a lot of you know finding your way through these early days of this but when the dust settles and you're able to do something a little bit more proactive there could be big opportunities in looking at how how can we use uh, digital collaboration tools more effectively that already exist. 
Mm -hmm. This is Jen, and I just, I love that suggestion question as well, and it reminded me that, you know, when we deployed our, our social intranet at Thomson Reuters, we really re-educated our internal communicators to say, you're not just the mouthpiece of the organization, you are the eyes and the ears of the organization, listening for those employee stories and enabling them to be the storytellers so that we have many yep. voices across the organization. And so, you know, we haven't talked a lot in this webinar about employee advocacy and, and particularly internal employee advocacy, but I think there's a huge role here for organizations that are um, already using those programs effectively and maturely to engage your advocates in the internal communications um, and, and really use that social internet, as you said, Mark, to, you know, to be effective and to continue those, um, that community building through that platform um, really effectively, because if it's always top-down messages, then, you know, you do start to lose some of the community that we are already losing by not having people able to gather physically. And just, just building on that, Jen, um, when I was at PepsiCo, we actually created an, kind of an employee panel that we went to just for a, a touch base and it included field folks to say, okay, is this communication on, on point? And right now you're probably moving too quickly for something like that, but down the road to have some type of uh, employee panel where they can give you feedback and what they're hearing out in the field and what they're hearing from their colleagues. It was absolutely invaluable. Right. And, and even for organizations that have a pretty strong social internet, one thing that they may not have done is to identify where the influencers are, it's not always who you might expect, right? So it's That's not exactly always right. the formalized channels. It's not always the CEO. The people who are most followed may be in procurement. We had we had one woman who was one of the most followed people, and it was because she was consistent. She really understood how to use the platform in a conversational way, talking about things people cared about. So it's a great time to look at your internal platform analytics and figure out who are the voices that folks are listening to, following, um, respect, and, and who really can influence some of the communications that don't need to come from formal channels or from your CEO. Good point. All right. For the first employee death due to coronavirus, who would be the best representative to the issue? That's a good one. That is um, good. I, I would say that that has to be coming from the CEO, don't you think, Mark? It, it does, I guess. But the what I immediately went to is what happens with the second death or a third or a tenth. Right. Um, does the CEO get behind each and every one of those? And perhaps he or she does. Um, it's it's a hard one to answer, but I think the the first one it, it probably it feels right, you know. Um, I think sometimes you have to go with your gut on those. But if there is a if there is God God forbid a, a, an employee death, first death, having the CEO um, illustrate the empathy uh, that the organization um, values and and wants to make sure is is felt by all employees. I think that's a, that's an appropriate, and I think a, a, as you kind of move further into it, if there are more, you have to kind of take a step back and just wonder at what rate is this happening, and does it still make sense to have the, the CEO address each and every one of those um, uh, fatalities, and, and hopefully it doesn't come to that. But it's a very good question. Um, I think the way to start it would definitely be have, having the CEO acknowledge it and, and show that empathy. Okay. What phrases do you recommend a CEO use to convey acknowledgement and empathy, and should they admit to personal anxiety? Hmm. Specific. Uh, that's interesting. Um, but I think I think that um, CEO should absolutely acknowledge that there is anxiety in the organization, but he or she really needs to model the behavior that that they want. To see, which is again keeping people calm. We want people to be knowledgeable, but the idea is to sort of bring bring the anxiety down. So I think acknowledging that that's absolutely um, acceptable in the organization is great. Um, but specific phrases. I'm trying to think, Mark, <laughs> we've, been, we've been writing this week. What have we been writing? Um, uh -huh. Yeah, good question. Um, it's, all, it's all a blur. Um, I, I think, yeah, it you know, is. 
<laughs> you know, uh, phrase, phrases like um, we have um, processes, um, we are gathering, we um, we be- the things that we believe or our um, our approach is, you know, rather than getting into the a lot of the emotion of it, I think it's more about you know leaders are expected to have language that says I'm I'm running the ship here I. I, um, I and my team have control, you know, things like rest assured. I think that's one I've used several times with a number of communications. I have like, used you know, that as well. Is, yeah. We've got, <laughs> we've got this covered uh, or we, we, we have a process in place. Um, we've done this before. In other words, it may not be exactly um, aligned to coronavirus, but we've had similar issues that have required the organization to go through significant um, adjustments uh, for conditions that are happening in our marketplace. So I think, you know, anything that builds confidence from we've, we've been here before, um, we have the processes in place, and you can, you can rest assured that we're on this. That, those are things that at least immediately come to mind. Yeah, I think it's that, um, you know, saying that you've got a crisis crisis team that's meeting around the clock, um, that they're looking at every single avenue of your business, again, that, that sort of uh, reassuring piece as well. Um, but, yeah, I think there's um, – that that's the point is that they should be saying what the company is doing. And then the last point I would make is that any time they can sort of um, – bring that back to the company values. Um, you'll, you'll see the safety and health of employees in almost every message. I would look at Delta CEO message. I thought that one was a really good one um, and had a good structure to it. So if you're looking for a good structure of a CEO message, it was for an external, but I thought it would apply very, very well to internal as well. And one other thing I'll just add, it's not a phrase, but it's a word that I think makes a lot of sense in this um, environment. And the word is together. So in other words, there's things that the company is going to do and continue to do, and we've got, you know, we, the leadership, have our arms around it. But there's also a, a an expectation that employees are going to do their part too, right? They're going to wash their hands. They're going to follow the protocols. They're going to call in. They're going to stay home if they're sick. And so when you use a phrase like "together," we've got this covered. Together, we're going to we'll 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 navigate these uncharted, you know, waters or whatever you want to call it. I think it 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 clearly sends a message that it's not all on the company to fix this for you. It's going to take both employees and their actions and their compliance with the guidelines that are given along with what the company is doing, the actions they're taking, the decisions that they're making to, to really uh, help the organization work through this, this uh, challenging time. Okay. Um, looks like this will be the last question. I'm seeing coronavirus layoffs in the news. How do we balance messages that convey empathy to employees with the possibility that there may be layoffs? I think you've got to balance that. Um, I do think you, you need to be transparent. Um, that I, I think the, where I've seen that be successful is how we've used it in the past. That you know we're we're trying to do everything possible for our employees from a health and safety standpoint, but we also have the business piece, and we need to. Uh, we might have to make some really tough decisions in the future. So um, I think it's it's a balance of the of the message, but um, obviously it's a it's a reality that I think a lot of employees are 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 looking right. And and it, again, it's also something that's driving their anxiety. Well, and the other thing to remember is that layoffs aren't always tied. It won't be tied only to this um, this this particular uh, outbreak or pandemic, there may be underlying business conditions where some of these, you know, we've all worked in organizations with significant restructuring and downsizing. Those things are often in the in the plans, you know, months in advance. And so that can be a particular challenge too, but hopefully there have been seeded messages that would indicate like, you know, the business is having some issues in these areas and these are things that are happening and these are possibilities. So I think to Sharon's point, the earlier you can seed um, the, uh, a message that just says, you know, we we're, we we want to show our our support and and uh, empathy for everybody who's involved in this, but we also ha- at times have to make some difficult decisions. Um, that that's that's the best that you can do uh, before you have to make the decision and then communicate about downsizing or, or job eliminations. All right, thank you, Mark and Sharon. Um, I think that concludes our Q&A.
and a recording of this session will be available on Disnology.com, and we will also be emailing a short survey with a link to the recording after the webinar. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Yes, thank you.